I'd like to open with something that has me very excited. These are my new boots. For anyone that's ever met me at my cart, this is generally the getup that I wear when I'm out serving hot dogs. I like to dress nicely, I like having clothes, I especially like footwear. I come, a, I come from a long line of men who really enjoy footwear. In fact, when we would go downtown shopping, we have a tradition in our family, every year the day after Thanksgiving, we'd go downtown Minneapolis, and we'd go see the, at the time, anybody remember Dayton's? Anybody from here remember Dayton's? The walkthrough storybook that was different every year? We would be there at the crack of dawn when the doors would open, and you'd, literally Dayton's would have an alarm bell that would go off, and we would rush in to do our mad day of shopping. And my dad and I, our first stop was always the shoe department from like day one. So this is my new pair of boots. I got these boots last week at a really, really cool shop here in the Twin Cities called Wilson and Willie's. Anybody familiar with Wilson and Willie's? Awesome stuff, great staff. Sadly, I didn't get a chance to be able to do an event with my hot dog cart with Wilson and Willie's recently because they had some construction going on. They now have this really cool back patio, and if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. But I wanted to go in and at least say hi, and I had been scoping out this pair of Oak Street Bootmakers boots for about a year. I kind of have a rule, personally, that if I'm going to spend money on something that's expensive, I like to wait at least three to six months before I pull the trigger to make sure I really, really want it, and I try to wait till the end of my hot dog season as a reward. So like one year, it was my Shinola watch. That was my reward for doing a good job. This year, it's my boots. And I walked in, and a very, very awesome woman named Anna was behind the counter, and she and I had emailed back and forth a lot. And so I started asking her a few questions about the boots, and they have some cool models of this same boot that are made specifically just for them. Uh, and I think that's really cool when companies can partner together and do things that are unique just to their business and develop that more intense relationship beyond just... A, I supply a product, and B, you buy said product. Now we have a friendship that we have uh, formed. So as we're talking, I pick up one of the boots, and we're talking about sizes, and I'm looking at it, and I've got a pretty wide foot. So I'm thinking, God, I hope these really fit, because I really, really dig these boots, and I follow at least 20 people on Instagram just because of these boots. That's how nerdy I am. So, and I've seen them in all states of wear and tear, and I'm just so excited. I'm like, oh, I really hope they fit. So as I'm looking at the boots, um, I come uh, from a career, before I started Nate Dogs, actually selling shoes. And so I know a lot about feet, about uh, foot problems. In fact, my friend Ben here is actually wearing what I used to sell. I used to sell Birkenstocks. And so I'm kind of talking about how these boots are constructed with Anna, and I'm, uh, I guess, assuming that she's aware of all of this construction and, you know, all of these kind of facts and information about these boots. Well, lo and behold, like, she's never heard any of this. I'm like wow, this is kind of cool. I like being the Cliff Clavin of useless knowledge when it's not actually useless knowledge. I like teaching people. I, it happens when they come to my hot dog cart, and I like doing it when I can share stuff that I've learned in a way that doesn't make the person feel like I'm kind of this big, pompous know-it-all. So I start talking about the boots and how they're moccasin construction and how they're going to stretch and form to your foot. And I said, has anybody ever shown you how to properly lace a pair of shoes or boots? She's like, what? And she's, of course, in a pair of really fashionable boots that have just a zipper up the side. So, you know, it's not going to... Often in women's shoes, this is something that you don't come across. But in men's footwear, there's a very unique way that you can actually lace a pair of shoes so they look really cool. It would be like, for any of you designers out there, it would be when you start talking about something like kerning. When you notice these little things in design or in footwear or in clothing, like a single stitch on a, on a hem or on a seam on a shirt, or just the way that things are detailed, like the way the patterns would match up on this gingham shirt. All these things matter to the eye. You just might not put your finger on it. So I'm explaining to her how to lace the shoes, and I'm trying them on as we're going, and kind of we're settling on a pair. Uh, and I finally picked this pair, and I said, all right, I'm going to go with these boots. She's like, you know what? She goes, I'm going to give you 20% off your boots. I'm like, holy crap, that's a huge amount. You don't have to do that. I'm happy to pay you the full amount for these boots. This has been great. She's like, no. And I apologize for saying the word like, by the way. Let me preface this. I have five children, all girls, under the age of 16. <laughs> so, so, so like is pretty much akin to breathing in the back house. So I apologize. Anyway, back to my story. 
she says, you have given me like the greatest lesson in how to fit these boots and in how to display them and, you know, and how to make this something that's a little bit more special than it normally would have been. She said, and I'm really grateful and you didn't do it in a way that made me feel like an idiot. I'm like, well, no, of course not. I love sharing that information. And then it empowers another person to actually, to one, maybe know, know more, but two, to then feel more empowered in what they do in their day-to-day -day life. And I was very, very grateful, and I walked out of that store, and here's the interesting side effect to doing something, essentially, I guess you could say, selfless for another person, or teaching them and in imparting your knowledge to them, is doing something selfish has a uniquely selfish side effect. It makes you, as the selfless person, feel extremely good about yourself when you do something kind or selfless for another person. And it's a really nice side effect. And I walked out and I immediately called my wife and I said, you aren't going to believe this. I said, I couldn't resist. I bought that favorite pair of boots that I'd been looking at. But like I was explaining, and I went on to tell my wife kind of everything we talked about. And she goes, and she gave me this like huge discount on my boots. All because I just told her a simple way to relace a pair of boots. And I thought, I didn't think much more about the story. My wife's parents were in town last week and I was sharing this story with my mother-in-law and talking about what I wanted to share with you guys here at this talk. And my mother-in-law says, well, why don't you share that story? I'm like, well, why would I share that story? That's kind of a boring story. She says, no. She said, you shared something from your heart with that person and that person was affected by what you shared. That's creating magic in really, really small moments. And it doesn't take very much. For any of you that have ever been to my hot dog cart, as I mentioned earlier, this is probably what you saw. A, you know, uh, barnwood that's over 100 years old, me generally wearing a gingham shirt. In fact, I like this gingham shirt right here, Ben. I have generally every color of gingham. More often than not, bow ties. One, because it's practical. When I have to bend down and pick up my hot dog cart and take it off the hitch or clean everything, I hate having to stuff a long, normal tie inside my shirt. So I generally wear a bow tie. Nate Dogs didn't start out like this. That's what Nate Dogs started out as. An upended hot dog cart at a freight company off 35W where the guy brought this out and said, okay, there you go. I'm like, what do you mean there you go? He's like, that's your cart. Um, can, can I borrow some like, metal snips to cut the banding off? He's like, oh yeah, okay. So he goes inside, helps me like, unload my cart and I have no instruction manual on how to take this cart. I understand how it goes on my hitch. You know, don't get me wrong. I've, that part wasn't so complicated. But do I leave that little silver part there on the right side? That's a griddle and a griddle cover. Well, that's not supposed to stand there when you drive down the road. I didn't know that. I went trucking down the road with that thing ziplocked or essentially shrink-wrapped to my cart. Thank God it didn't fall off. Little did I know on my first drive home with that cart, these carts are essentially made to go on the highway, but not really made to go on the highway. I take them 70 miles an hour to places like Duluth, New Richmond, Wisconsin, Owatonna, Mankato. They've been all over, but there are these things under cars and under trailers like this called leaf springs. Anybody know what a leaf spring is? Super durable, but you know, absorbs some of the shock. Well, the leaf springs on this cart fit through these little tiny collars. And they're supposed to stay in those collars. Little did I know that literally on my first drive home, I hit a bump so hard, it popped the leaf springs right out of the collars. And for literally two months, I drove that having no shock absorption on my cart. So I've learned all of these interesting things about how to run a hot dog cart like this. And we took that cart and added a really cool, I think a cool logo to it. Um, started out with an umbrella that I bought at Home Depot that didn't even fit my stand because the umbrella hadn't come with my cart. They hadn't shipped it in time. So I had to like, on the first couple of days down on 4th and Hennepin, which was my first corner, I'd have to hold the umbrella with one hand while trying to hold like the hot dog bun down and then quick fill it with a hot dog, put mustard on it, and then hold the umbrella again. As we started this cart, I thought, well, what are some ways that I can differentiate? Because I really wanted to take a hot dog cart, which is nothing new. It's been done countless times before in New York and Chicago and San Francisco. And really make it something that was, one, not, not only branded well, but two, something that was really unique in both food trucking and also just in restaurants in general. And what I started to realize with a hot dog cart is, for any of you that have ever been to a food truck, food trucks are super cool. I think my hot dog cart's pretty cool. 
But when you walk up, you have this window and this barrier between you and the people that you're interacting with. And you interact for a brief moment, you give them your order, you maybe say, hi, how are you doing? You having a good day? But if it's busy and you have a long line of people and you're conscientious at all, you think, well, I probably gotta move over here and get out of the way for the next person to come up and order their food. What if I could create an environment around my cart where I could have you know, as long a line as I want out the serving side of my cart, but if somebody wants to stand over here on the other side, we can keep talking and having a moment even while I'm serving hot dogs over here. My background before I started this hot dog cart, I'm a singer by profession. So I graduated with a degree in vocal performance, intended to go into Broadway. That was my career path. So my, one of my claims to fame is, anybody here ever been to the Minnesota State Fair talent show at the State Fair? Anybody ever seen that, the amateur talent show? 1996 winner right here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was a blast. I loved it. And the next summer, or that uh, following year, got married and auditioned that fall for my first show that I could audition for at the Ordway. Got a role in the chorus. I was like, woo! I've made it. And I didn't enjoy it at all. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy the singing. I didn't enjoy the community that went with it. That was something that was really not um, conducive to, one, being married, um, in whatever shape that takes, and two, having a family. It certainly wasn't conducive to that. My wife was a teacher. We wanted to have a, a good-sized family. I was gone every evening. She was gone all day, and we just never saw each other. And I, I, I realized early on, I thought, I just don't want that as a life. But I enjoyed that part of, that creative part of my personality. So when you're in any kind of performance, and anyone going to school here at McNally understands this, you have to have some other way to pay your bills. So you either do kind of one of two things. You work retail, or you wait tables, or work in a restaurant in some form. Well, I worked retail. Partly because of my new boots. I mean, I love clothes. So, I, you know, you amass this kind of... Uh, Long history of experience working and I started out managing an American Eagle Outfitters. Can't imagine myself doing that now at 42. I'd be like the dorkiest hipster ever. <laughs> My kids would hate me. That's what it would be. Um, uh, I've sold, you know, high quality Birkenstock shoes. Um, I've actually run the operations for a design build remodeling firm of all things. And through all of those kind of different experiences and, and in and amongst that countless offices, uh, temp jobs, factory jobs, worked at McDonald's in high school, kind of done the whole gamut. The thing that I found that really makes me personally come alive is having some type of information or knowledge that you can then pass on to another person, and not just pass on to another person, but have them leave the experience feeling excited, empowered, more passionate about what they just got, and not just here's this thing, walk away, you're happy because you have this thing. It's like, you know, what makes, uh, I'm trying to think what would be a good example. What makes owning an iPhone great? It's certainly not the best phone. There are other phones that are better out there, but it's an iPhone. And you get to be part of this community of people that make it feel more special than it actually is. You, I was trying to create moments like that. I serve hot dogs. Now, these are delicious hot dogs. They're all natural, locally raised pork, uh, no hormones, no antibiotics. I make all the toppings from scratch. Having the quality product part, that, that was kind of the easy part. But going back to the idea of standing around my cart, I thought, looking back at my experience as a singer and in all of that retail, being in front of people is certainly very comfortable for me. It doesn't make me nervous. My heart doesn't start pounding. I get anxious, of course, because you want to be you want to have excellence. But I thought, what if I can create a small amount of theater in this space here right around my hot dog cart? How cool would that be when you walk up and you leave feeling better about yourself than when you walked up and, all, and really all you got out of it was a hot dog and maybe a bag of chips and something to drink? Well, any environment, design, architecture, construction, restaurants, food trucking, can have those opportunities to create those moments. You just have to be conscious for them. So when I started out slinging these hot dogs, this is a picture when I was still operating downtown Minneapolis. 
And my intent was just to try to operate in downtown Minneapolis for as long as possible to be able to do smaller or bigger private events to where I could actually spend even more time with the people that I was serving. After a couple of really, really nice uh, write-ups in a couple of local papers, um, I've been, we've been listed with Nate Dogs in four national top food truck lists, um, uh, City Pages uh, and Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine in my first year voted me best dressed food trucker, so I was pretty right. happy with that one. Um, uh, just this year was listed in the top five hot dog vendors in the entire US. And, and the part of that, all those awards feel really, really nice, um, but they go away very, very quickly. Just like opening a new restaurant, within another couple of weeks, there's another new restaurant that comes right along that's maybe cooler and newer and does something different. So how do you, how do you create something that transcends being the next best thing? All of those awards and accolades literally kind of came across my desk when one of my followers on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook said, hey, buddy, did you see you're in this list of best food trucks? No. Well, now I did, and so you're like, sweet, this is great. Every time one of those lists would come out, um, with the exception of one, uh, very first one, have all been a surprise. And I honestly think in doing this business and really wanting to focus on the human aspect of what makes life interesting and what makes life really special, I feel really good about those things being a surprise and the fact that my kind of tribe of people who like my hot dogs, uh, they're all letting me know those things without me having to find them or to go, hey, here's your PR release, this is gonna go out in a week, you know, let's do a blast for this. I kinda like being surprised by fame a little bit. I think it's, I think it's more enjoyable. And one of the things that I'd like to share with you, actually three things that I'd like to share with you um, explaining how you can really set yourself apart no matter what you do, and I think what makes Nate Dogs really unique. Remember people's names. Now, Drew mentioned that he was so surprised after five months that I remembered his name, remembered where he worked, stuff about him. I don't always get it right the first time, but I always ask again, and I always do it with eye contact. Shake their hand, give them a fist bump if I'm serving, and really try to use their name as many times as possible. There are really, I believe, I, I don't have statistical facts or information to back this up, but I really believe that one of the most important and special things you can do for another human being is to remember their name. How many of you have gone to an event where you know that you know somebody? And, and, and you get one of these responses, hey, how's it going? Or, yeah, dude, what's up? And you say their name and then they're like, crap, inside they're dying because they don't remember. We've all been there. And, and I try to be... I personally, it doesn't bother me if people don't remember my name. Mine's easy to remember, especially in my business, because it's all over my stuff. <laughs> so generally, the question is, uh, and in fact, this just came up today, is, you know, you could always just hire Nates, and then everybody, are you Nate? Yeah, I'm Nate. Um, or what you do is just use their name every time, and when they come up, just say, I know we met last time. You ordered maybe this, or we talked about this. Tell me your first name again, please. You will be absolutely flabbergasted at the response that you get from people when you actually say their name on a regular basis. Their eyes will brighten up, their posture will, you know, kind of straighten up. There was a young woman when I worked remodeling homes, we officed in International Market Square. For any of you that have never been there, it's a pretty cool building. It's kind of like working in a college dorm room, so to speak. Everybody knows everybody, we all have lunch together, um, you pass on the stairs. I made it a point, one, because I needed exercise sitting at a desk out every day. We officed on the fifth floor. I'd take the stairs every day. And every day, the stairs were right in front of a, I guess you could call it a, a, a very high-end tile, uh, plumbing fixtures, um, bathtubs, um, furnishing store. That was right there in the ground level. And there was a very nice young woman. Her name was Nicole. And every day, she would sit, and this is pre-Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, she would just sit kind of hunched over at her desk, typing on her computer. And she'd come, you know, she'd perk up when people would come into the shop as part of her job, but for the most part, she'd walk kind of like this, sort of hunched over. And I didn't feel sorry for her, but I just thought, oh, she's such a nice, such a nice person. You know, what could you do that would actually make her head, you know, stand up and give her a little more confidence? Or just even encourage her. 
So went and met her, and then every day I would walk by, good morning, Nicole, how's it going? And that was generally all it was. And her head would kind of pop up, and her eyes would get really bright. She's like, oh, doing pretty good today. You know, it's kind of slow or whatever. You know, anyway, whatever small talk we would make. And I'm like, have a great day. But every time I would see her, and I would do that with as many people as I could. And if I was really lucky, it would end up, I'd get to eventually get to hug them. Because that's my favorite. <laughs> so if any of you have ever come up to my cart, and I kind of know you, I'm probably going to go in for a hug. So just be ready for it. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. And that leads me to step two. Engage with people more, once you've gotten their names or once you've kind of gotten to that point where people acknowledge them, add a physical connection to your interactions with people. So much of what we do is Snapchat. Like, there's a like again, sorry. If my children, I'll look over at them and my daughter will be, and I want to reach across the couch and smack the Snapchat out of her hand and go, stop taking pictures of your own face. Take a picture of something funny, like make me look like a giant balloon animal. I'm happy with that. But do something that's not your face all the time. So when I'm at my cart and I'm serving hot dogs, I, generally I don't want to shake people's hands because I'm trying to keep my hands clean and all of that. So we'll do elbow bumps or fist bumps. But even better is when I can hug everybody. And Michael and Jamie, they know, right? Hugs are where it's at, man. They just feel so good. And when you get that, and don't do the hug where you kind of do the stiff as a board or kind of one of these, pat the back. Like, go in for it, especially guys hugging each other. Just go for it, man. It feels so good. What it does is it adds another layer um, to our humanity, to, to actually being touched by a person that's not your mom or dad or your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your kids. It makes you realize that we actually have for lack of a better term, energy that we share back and forth between each other. Um, and Lord knows we need more positive energy sharing back and forth between each other, um, considering all the crap that's going on in the news nowadays. It's almost like you have to block all social media in general just to keep people from screaming at each other. Um, and lastly, what I'd like to wrap up on, this is my family. They range in age from right between my wife and I, that's my wife Kim. Top head there, that's my 16-year-old Emma. Right below her with the braces, she no longer has braces, and looks beautiful, is Grace. Far right is Olivia, she's 12. And the two in the middle there, believe it or not, those are fraternal twins. Evelyn in the glasses, she's a spitfire. And Sophie over there, and she's got red hair. The last thing I want to leave you with, when you're creating these small moments of magic, and, and trust me, Remembering someone's name and giving them a hug, those things are magical. And I really believe, and for me especially as a person of faith, I really believe that those create moments that are holy. For however short or long they are, those are holy moments where you really get to experience a person's, um, I guess, soul. Uh, and you really then can develop a connection that goes way more, or way farther than... A, I provide a really good hot dog, or, and B, you eat and buy said hot dog. You create a connection there that lasts far beyond when I'm stopped serving hot dogs. The last thing I want you to remember is, by all means, don't sacrifice who you are uh, or your family or those who are most important to you for what it is that you dream about. I think probably most people would look at something like my hot dog cart, or a business you started, or a cool product you invented, and go, God, that's gotta be your dream. One of the things I've realized is that you're gonna have a whole bunch of dreams. You think back when you were a kid, maybe one day you wanted to be an astronaut, another day a doctor, another day you wanted to be like, a, I remember we wanted to be Evil Knievel when I was a kid, if anybody knows who Evil Knievel was. We used to jump our dirt bikes all sorts of crazy ways, and I have the stitches, scars to prove it. Just know that I often say this to people, actually I say this to people a lot. What you think is the most interesting thing about a person is generally the least interesting thing about them. So my hot dog cart, totally least interesting thing about me. Joe Maurer is a baseball player, I promise you that's the least interesting thing about him. It's interesting, but there are other things that are far more uh, spectacular about, and that's just an example, but the people that you think are recognizable or memorable for A, B, or C, 
get to know them on that layer that's below what they're known for. Because, I don't know, and maybe not too long, I might want to do something else other than Nate Dogs. And I don't want to have them be one of the things left in my wake as I go on to pursue my next dream. Because all of what we do is for the people we care about. And those are the people that I care about the most. If anything with my business starts to take away from them, I am more than happy to pull up stakes and try something totally new. If it means that I get to spend more time with them. And in doing that, if I have a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or whatever day kind of that I want, I can go, hey, Emma, you want to go to a Twins game with me today? I'll take you out of school. Yeah, great. So I took Emma to a Twins game. And then Grace says, Dad, can we have a special day out from school? Yes, what should we do? Can we go bike riding? Yes. Can we have a picnic? Absolutely. So we, we went and we had a picnic. And on almost every one of those days, you'll always run into somebody you know. And invariably, if it's a nice day, what do they say? Why aren't you out running the hot dog cart today? Well, I might. My employee might be out running it, but I have something more important to do. I'm spending time with my kids. Why would I need to be doing anything else than doing that? Um, so make sure that the people that are important to you don't get sacrificed for what you do for your dream. So in closing, remember names as much as you can. And I know a lot of people assume that names come naturally and that some people are just good at it. They're not. It is a ton, a ton of work, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Secondly, actually make a physical connection with people. Handshake, high five. Uh, make eye contact. Uh, and then third, remember why it is that you do what you do. Make sure that the reasons why you create good art and why you produce this product or why you uh, make beautiful homes, whatever it is that you do to inspire others, remember that the people that are most important to you were there first before you started that. And they're going to be there when you're not doing that anymore. And so remember that that's the part of life that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good, that's a lot of energy. I have a fair amount. Um, thanks so much, Nate. Uh, we're going to do a little, we have a little bit of time for Q&A, and uh, if anyone has a question, I think the room is small enough that we can just shout out questions. I'll start off with one, though. Yep. Okay, so... Nate, aren't you like the craziest extrovert? You're, you know, wearing your <laughs> bow ties and stuff. You have all this energy. Obviously, it's easy for you to high five people and hug them and remember their names. Um, what if I'm like, you know, really introverted? Yep. What about then? I'm what you would call an outgoing introvert. Uh, and, and I found this out, honestly, more, or I felt more at home in that kind of description of who I am, more in the last five years since starting Nate Dogs than I have in my whole life. Because when you are more introverted, a lot of times you put on this outer facade that's often funny, outgoing, bubbly, can interact with anybody because you're just trying to kind of keep people, sometimes I think at a distance, so they don't actually find out who you really are and what you actually really think because that would be too scary for people to know. I'm way more introverted than people ever would imagine, but I'm outgoing as a matter of how I like to interact with people. But what makes me the most excited, like I think about an event that I have coming up tomorrow. It's a big beer festival over by the Grain Belt Bottling House called Autumn Brew Review. We'll end up seeing probably anywhere from 350 to 500 people over the course of the day. I literally wait for the moments where I get to see someone that I really know and I get to hug them and for that one moment it's just me and that person and I don't have to be on all the time. I can be on but by the end of that four or five hour event I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm exhausted. So it's a lot of work but it's work that I enjoy. So hopefully that answers the question. I think when you're, to, to answer the second part of it, being an introvert. I do think extroverted or introverted we do have to have a common understanding of sometimes stepping more outside our comfort zone to try to engage with people a little bit more. Um, and then on the other side, like if you're an extrovert, hold back a little bit more and allow people a little extra time to warm up to you. And don't assume that if they don't talk to you right away that they don't like you. Because when you have dinner with that person in a group of friends, 
you might suddenly find you have a million things in common. It just took a little more time to allow them to warm up to it. So that's why I hope I can get to see people on more instances than one with my business because then you kind of find out more of what makes them tick and you can try to pull out uh, more things that interest them. All right, we have some questions, so I will take one in a minute. So um, think of questions about creativity, questions about how to interact with people, questions about the best toppings for hot dogs. Anything is fair game, so yeah, just raise your hand and we'll shout out, we'll start over here. Uh, yeah, it was kind of twofold. Um, one, my job was coming to an end. <laughs> it, due in part because the, the gentleman that I worked for, I really had every intention and wanted to buy these stores from him to have my own shoe stores because I love shoes. But one, I couldn't afford it, and two, he wasn't in a position to sell it to me. So I thought, well, I've got to do something else, but I don't know what to do. And so he knew I was kind of antsy, but I had an end point. Um, uh, I started kind of getting antsy. This was probably summer of 2010, and I launched Nate Dogs in May of 2011. One of my really, really good friends, who has since sadly passed away, was an entrepreneur and creative uh, who ran, how would I describe this? It was a store in Austin, Texas called Enchante. And he sold uh, fine European fragrances, um, French soaps. Uh, he made all of his own men's shaving supplies, like shaving brushes, shaving creams, all of this was 10, 15 years ago. So kind of he was a pioneer in his field. So me being a person who loves things that are high quality and unique and something that nobody else has, I bought one of his shaving brushes and kind of bought the whole system. We became friends over the phone, actually got to meet in person uh, about, I guess it's probably eight years ago now. But we would talk for at least two, three hours on the phone, almost to the point where it was, uh, I, I had to like, I gotta hang up now, I gotta go to work. So <laughs> he mentioned to me one day, he said, Nate, you know what? The average male, if you haven't started your entrepreneurial or creative endeavors by the time you hit 37, chances are, I think he said something like 85% chance you'll never do it. I'm like, well, that's, that's gonna suck if I, I was 36 at the time. <laughs> so I'm like, well, shoot, I should probably get going on this. And so I thought, well, what could I do? And I started actually really thinking about it. So I like, originally looked at opening up a, a trailer that would serve barbecue, because I liked making barbecue and was pretty good at it. And he mentioned to me one day, he said, Nate, if you do barbecue, that's great. He said, but you don't have a lot of ways other than just like a sauce or two to differentiate. Your, your meat's all gonna kind of start the same, because somebody else could open up right next to you using the same meat, and they might smoke it a little bit better. Then what do you do? He said, you know what you should do? And bear in mind, he had no idea that hot dogs are my absolute favorite food. Like, Hands and above, a good steak, anything, hot dogs are the best. He goes, you should start a hot dog cart. And I about fell off my stool. I was like, how the heck did he know I love hot dogs? <laughs> and he goes, and this, he goes, a couple reasons. One, you can make all your condiments and sauces. So you have a wider variety of things that will differentiate you. You could have like the best hot dog. Get it from somebody that makes it all local and all natural and all of that stuff. He said, but two, you don't have to go into a world of debt to start your business. Couldn't have been better advice for me because I was able to get two carts virtually with no debt and have a, a, a sustainable business without having to pay all of that off. Um, and so when he mentioned the hot dog cart, I started Googling and looking on eBay for hot dog carts. And pretty soon, by November, I was getting my uh, food manager certification. I was starting to call the city and wade through the myriad piles of crappy paperwork to try to get licensed with all the different municipalities. And by end of March, I was unemployed without a hot dog cart, that cart that you saw, and was getting ready to launch in May. And that's how I started Nate Dogs. So it was crazy, it was really crazy. But I think one of the things I didn't touch on kind of in talking earlier that I also feel very strongly about is that a lot of creatives, entrepreneurs, risk takers think that once you get to certain points in life, you sacrifice the ability to take on certain risks. When you get married maybe, when you have kids especially, um, you have responsibilities, and those are all true. They're all very true things. But I think I owe it to my children to show them that you can have all these responsibilities and still take a calculated risk and the world is not gonna fall apart. 
Because, you know, if the world, like if everything fell out, the bottom fell out of my hot dog business, dude, I can walk and work at McDonald's. I can go to Walmart. I can go to Costco. I can get a job selling shoes anywhere at any retail clothing shop. You're going to be okay. You might have to tighten the belt quite a bit, but you're going to be okay. The world is not going to end. And I think knowing that taking a risk like that, that seems huge, isn't as big a risk as you might think because you're thinking about minimizing all of the really ridiculous risks so that when you take the actual big risk, you're really aware of everything that could possibly happen. Does that make sense? And that's how I started. That was kind of the, the push into the deep end to start my hot dog cart. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, my wife is a music pastor at a, a local church in Crystal, and so I sing with her pretty regularly. Um, I don't sing as much outside of church, like paid gigs for weddings or creative stuff, nearly as much as I used to just because the schedule for kind of the prime season where I might get hired as a, someone to come and sing at a wedding ceremony is also the busiest time when I do my hot dog business. But I cater parties like that all the time. And every once in a while, I'll actually get a chance to like step up and sing in front of somebody. And I tried singing downtown, but there's kind of this fine line between, hey, there's somebody singing and they sound kind of okay. And what the hell is that crazy guy doing with the hot dog cart singing on the street? I'm totally not getting a hot dog from him. So there's this fine balance between that. And, and when it's really busy, you're doing kind of, I'm, I sort of pride myself on being very fast when I'm at the cart, you know, like you get your food really quickly so you can serve a rapid line of people in a really short amount of time. There just sort of becomes a practicality to not being able to do that. But I think when I can wrap in the, the performance aspect of singing and being in front of people and creating a little bit of theater using my cart as a platform, then I feel like I can really sort of flex that creative muscle even when I'm not getting a chance to sing. I still would like to, uh, one of these falls audition for maybe a local show in the winter and actually do some performing again. I would like to do that uh, and get back to that. Basically, by the time I get to October, my brain is complete mush and I'm just ready to like binge watch 14 shows on Netflix and not think about anything. So I'm trying to push myself, that's one of my boundaries I try to push myself through is to continue to stay uh, proactive and creative in the off season. There's one back here that will get to yours. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure. Uh, one of the ways that I've done that on purpose is to stay small. So I've only had two hot dog carts. Um, when I first started out, it was either friends kind of in family that would come and volunteer at things like Autumn Brew Review or Darkness Day at Surly, big festivals where I had to serve the hot dogs and we needed people to actually serve chips and take money and get all of that other stuff taken care of. And one of my good friends who kind of helped me long term in the first couple of years at almost every event, I thought, you know, I can take a, a, a gamble and put my, my trust in him to be able to take a cart out on his own. Because what's unique about my business, as opposed to finding an employee to work on a food truck, is you have to be the food service, you have to be the cleaner, the transportation, and you have to be kind of the star of the show. So you can't really be somebody that's super shy and can't talk to people at all. You don't have to be a super extrovert, but you at least have to be outgoing enough to talk to people because that's the brand that I established when I started. And so it was tricky. Um, I, I, I do think in all the years of managing anywhere from 20 employees down to just myself or one employee, uh, finding good employees is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in business. Uh, and not finding employees that can't do the job, that's actually not the hard part. The hard part is finding people that want to be more than just an employee, that want to actually think for themselves and take initiative, even if they make the wrong choice, actually take an initiative and make a decision, take a, take a risk, um, rather than have to call the person in charge and go, oh, are you sure this is okay? Yeah, I told you, but it's okay. You can, you know, you can do whatever you think you need to, I, I'm, I'll back you, and we'll deal with it after the fact. Um, I get asked a lot, you know, why don't you have more hot dog carts? When are you going to have a brick and mortar restaurant? Um, and all of those at various points sounded intriguing to me. 
but I've come to realize in, in meeting other interesting creatives, I guess you could put it, I would rather put this dream kind of in the past or on the shelf and start something completely new than try to extend a brand and become bigger because that's just gonna take more time away from my family. So that means if I have five carts to run, now I have four employees plus myself that I have to manage, make sure they're getting out to their events. So I'm working generally then six, seven days a week, especially during the busy season. And then I'm home even less. And so I purposely kept my business small so that I could have the life that I wanted to be able to not have to work on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. I can say yes or no to all of those things. Like during the school year, I take no events on a Wednesday because that's date night. And every Wednesday we have date night. And we're really fortunate that all of our kids are old enough to be in stuff at church on Wednesday. Why churches have it all on Wednesday is beyond me, but it's always Wednesday. And we get date night for an hour, hour and a half. When I have a restaurant or multiple carts, I lose some of those benefits that I worked really hard to get. And I'm happy to have either just me or fewer employees to try to maintain that lifestyle. Does that answer your question? Cool. Uh, it kind of ties into what I just answered for them. I would rather, um, there's a, I'll use this as an example. There was a hot dog place in Chicago called Hot Dogs. Anybody ever heard of Hot Dogs? Delicious. I was fortunate enough to be able to stop in the last year he was open and actually say hi to him, tell him that I ran a hot dog cart. He was the sausage guy in the US. Like he was, he set the bar for how to run a restaurant like that. Well, when he decided, boy, I think it's maybe been two years now, to, to close up shop, everyone was all up in arms. What are you gonna do? Aren't you gonna let somebody else carry it on? And I really appreciated his take on it. He said, you know what? I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish. I'm ready to do something else. And I think it's pretty, when you as a creative get ready to do something else, the hardest thing is everyone else around you might not be ready to move on to something else as quickly as you're ready to move on to something else. And that's okay, uh, because that's how you push the creative boundary. I think as a, uh, a, a, like I guess a tactile artist, a painter, a sculptor, uh, uh, a photographer, you take all of those things and you have these moments that you've created but by the time a painter typically is done with the painting, they're already creating the next painting. And very often, more, or very often, they might just paint over the one they just painted. Because what you have to realize is that what the, the item you've created is just part of who you are. It isn't who you are. It's just one aspect of who you are. And it's okay to have that and go, oh, that was a really cool season. Now I'm gonna move on and do something else. And rather than take something that's so associated with me and try to franchise it out to other people to have them become mates all over the place, I would rather go, all right, I'm done with that, and now I'm gonna do this other cool thing over here. And that, that's what I personally want to do. Um, one, because I just think it's more interesting. I would rather, I like, the, I like the jump off the cliff into something that's unknown. I think it keeps me, uh, I think it keeps my brain functioning uh, in a much more, uh, much more healthy way so that I don't sit and kind of just get bored. Um, I guess one thing that would apply to that, I, I look at the creative process kind of like, a, I, uh, someone explained this to me last year at a creative conference, looking at the creative process as a clock. If you imagine that 12 o'clock is the start and the launch of your new dream. Everything's exciting, you feel like you're gonna throw up a little bit. So you, <laughs> one, two, three o'clock, you've, you've taken the dive and you're in this crazy process trying to just keep your head above water. Well, three o'clock, you start to get some accolades. You start to have some good press, or people are liking what you have. People are, are buying it, they're hiring you. By five, you know, four, five, six o'clock, things are really humming, and now you're kind of managing, there's that franchising part. You're managing something that's going well and is, is successful. If it's not going well, you suddenly skip to nine o'clock and you start thinking of what do we do next, and you move to 12 o'clock to launch a dream again or to do some new endeavor. Uh, what was really interesting is he said, as you get to nine o'clock, that's when you start to think about what's my next adventure? What do I wanna create next? What's the next risk that I wanna take? He said, if you're truly a person that thrives on the creativity and that entrepreneurial process of always pushing yourself to, to, to do new things and to make new and good art, you have to go from three and you have to skip six o'clock and jump right to nine o'clock. And he said, you either have to let go of the thing that's now functioning at six o'clock and move on completely, or somebody else has to take that over. You have to get like, say for instance, in a clothing shop, you have to find a manager. 
or if you're going to, let's say, make boots, you might not be the person that's suddenly sitting behind the stitching machine actually making the boots. You now are creating and growing your brand while someone else handles your sales. Um, because then you have to become a leader. And I think as a, uh, a truly creative entrepreneur, the most important thing we can do business-wise is to lead. And when we get sucked into the day-to-day -day operations of our businesses, then we lose the ability to be proactive and start leading um, in new directions. Hopefully that makes sense. There's a couple questions over here, maybe? Yeah, what, in the stripes right here? Sure. <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, I'll sing what I sang for you guys uh, when I won the State Fair Talent Show. I'll just sing a little snippet. It's a song from Miss Saigon uh, called Why God. Uh, and it's, at the point in the song, just to give you a little backstory, it's uh, the soldier is American and he's fallen in love with this prostitute who he kind of got paired with and now he's wondering, I didn't think I would love her. Why do I love her now and now I have to go home? So it's, why God, why this face? Why such beauty in this place? I liked my memories as they were, but now I'll leave remembering her. That's a little snippet of it. Thank you. I, I, I really hope in the next six to nine months that I can do that again, because I really miss it, but um, anyway, so hopefully, uh, oh, thanks, I appreciate it. Were there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. One last one. Uh-huh, yep. Um, I, I think each time you take the step, it gets a little bit easier. Kind of the, the overriding, gut-wrenching fear gets a little bit easier. Um, I think even if you love and plan to do for another 10 years the creative thing you're doing now, start taking tiny, tiny increments towards something that will be off in the future so that you're already, you know, 10 steps into whatever it is that you're thinking of launching. So by the time, let's say, uh, you know, your job at a very, you know, stable uh, uh, company is going to suddenly come to an end. You're not starting from ending point and starting at zero building something new again. You've got an idea kind of in the works that you can start to, to build on. And I think the ways, one of the ways you can minimize that is if you really want to go after kind of your next dream job or your next creative adventure, figure out kind of the basic amount of time you need to do with your current job to get the work done, and then take every other spare moment just in your work day to get that, to start thinking about that new dream. And then, then as that starts to grow, start taking, you know, so let's say your job goes from eight in the morning till five or six at night. Go home, have some supper, kind of relax, take a shower, exercise, whatever you need to do, and then take another hour or two hours in the evening and do more work on your dream. Start to kind of get steps in place and then as that starts to take a bigger shape, if you feel like you actually want to take the dive on that, start doing three or four hours in the evening. So by the time you get home, you're already starting to now launch that product kind of in your spare time. And then, you know, if you have a boss that's really cool with this, you can start to minimize time at work, maybe decrease your pay a little bit if the other thing is starting to generate some income. Uh, work fewer hours so you can do more stuff with your business so you're not, you know, lighting the candle at both ends because when you start your next adventure, you're gonna burn the candle at every end. It's gonna just be melting all over the place. <laughs> so I, I try to think, build margins into your, um, into your day so that when something else has to take more, you've got a little extra to give over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Woo -hoo, all right, well, famous. Nate's got lots more advice, and I'm sure uh, you can probably grab him in the hallway afterwards and ask him a question or two more, but I think that's a good place to, to finish off. So thanks so much, Nate. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much for having me.